Amen. Hey guys. Good morning. Y'all doing good today? Hey, uh, let me give you a quick update on Pastor and Judy, uh, aka my mommy and daddy. They are recovering. Uh, everything is going as well as expected and even better than expected, which is good. Uh, my mom was actually dealing with some, some fairly intense discouragement by the timelines that her doctors were giving her as far as her ankle healing up. As you know, she uh, shattered her, her left ankle basically in the motorcycle accident they were in a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, they were basically telling her, hey, you're, not, you're probably not going to be able to put weight on this for about three months or so. Uh, she had a follow-up appointment with her doctors and her surgeons this last week, and they cut that timeline in half. I said, it should be about four to six weeks, and then you're going to be at least able to start walking a little bit on it. So uh, dad also had a doctor's appointment this week, the day before mom had hers, and uh, his injuries are healing up nicely as well. As you know, he fractured his back in a few different places, but that's healing as expected. Uh, they told him on his, or at his appointment this Wednesday that uh, unbeknownst to him or any of us that he actually did puncture a lung whenever he hit the ground, but that's healing nicely as well too. Um, so it was sore and hurting him and it was uh, kind of hurt to breathe for a long time, but that's, that's coming along and some of his timelines have been shortened too. So uh, they wanted me to express two things to you. Their deep love for you, deep love for you. Well, my, my wife and I went over to their house after service last Sunday and there was just kind of this like melancholy in the air. You know, and they've had some up days and down days, so we drove away from there, and my, my wife said, I think it's a, another down day for them. And I said, yeah, that sounds about right. But I, I talked to my mom the next day. I said, hey, we were concerned about you yesterday. Are you guys doing okay? And she just almost started crying. She's like, it's a Sunday, and we can't go to church. I mean, that's just heartbreaking to us. We, we don't like not being there with our family. So they love you, they adore you, they miss you, they're going to be back as soon as they possibly can. The second thing they wanted me to convey to you is how grateful from the depths of their hearts they are for the outpouring of love, concern, help, assistance, meals. Uh, our, our phones have not stopped ringing saying, what can I do? When can I do it? Uh, Zach Smith, are you in here, Zach? Maybe, maybe he's helping out in kids' church. Last Sunday, he, all, he almost had this like frustrated demeanor. He came up to me, he's like, what can I do for your parents? He almost had this, this vibe of, you better tell me something or I might punch you in the face right now. <laughs> all right, and that's been the overall just attack that this church has taken for my family. And I, I can't tell you enough how grateful we are how, uh, how in love we have all fallen with the body of Christ again in this season. There's nothing like the body of Christ. There's nothing like having brothers and sisters in the Lord that, I mean, the familial love has been poured out on my family in this dire season, and that never would have happened outside of this context. Do you realize that? You, you know, I mean, church is problematic sometimes, right? We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Um, church can be hard. Relationships can be difficult. But there's nothing like family. And that's what the Bible calls us in this room as a family of Christ, the family of God. And that has become abundantly apparent to my parents, to myself, to my sister, to my wife, my sister's family. And we just love you. I mean, we love you, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, again, it's going to be a few weeks before you see mom and dad back here in all their glory, but, uh, but when you do, know that they have yearned for that day for many, many weeks, and they're probably struggling again today, being at home and having to sit around. So uh, keep them in your hearts, keep them in your prayers, and uh, I will keep you posted on how things are going with them. In the meantime, hey, um, I'm Pastor Kruger for the next few weeks. Huh? So this fear came across my mind that immediately next Sunday our attendance is going to be like cut in half. We're like, I don't know, Kruger Sr. is a good guy, Kruger Jr. I don't know about. Um, before we get into it this morning, I've got, I've got an exciting topic I want to share with you, uh, but I want to be transparent and I'm going to ask for some prayers right now. Um, as I was standing over there playing the guitar for worship earlier, I haven't been feeling all that well this entire morning, or actually for the past few days, quite honestly, but as I'm standing over there, I'm just about positive I got hit with a fever. Have you guys ever had fever come on, like really, so like, I just, I'm nauseous and I'm sweating and... Um, so instead of standing up here and belly aching about that, I'm going to take that as a validation that I'm going to say something today that the enemy does not want you to hear. 
So might I say, standing in the grace and the power of Jesus Christ, in your face, Satan, I'm up here anyway. If i got to run out and go throw up real fast and run back, back in, you guys talk amongst yourself for a few minutes, and I'll be right back in the saddle, okay? Um, so let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I ask you for your healing grace and virtue to cover my body right now. Right now, Jesus, I know that you have given me a word to speak to these precious people. I know that the Spirit of God is here. I know that we have paved the way for you to speak to us by lifting the name of Jesus Christ high and setting him as the object of our affections this morning. So, Jesus, let nothing derail what you want to do in this room. Let nothing derail what you want to do in this room. I am your servant. We are your people. We are here for you and for you alone, God. So speak. Speak. Give us ears to hear what it is you want us to say this morning. In the matchless, powerful, holy name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm taking the next few weeks here, and I, I, I wanna, I'm going to preach for you a series on being a healthy church. A healthy church is precious. A healthy church is powerful. A healthy church is something I know that each one of us desires, so I'm going to talk to you about some things that a healthy church should look like and should expect. And there's some interesting analogies we can look at just in the world around us. If we are not healthy in body, we cannot perform correctly, right? Listen, we, if we are healthy in body, we should be able to wake up in the morning and expect to be able to swing our legs out of bed, stand up on our own power, walk out the door, take oxygen into our lungs, and perform the day's tasks with success. If we're healthy, we should be able to expect that. If we can't do any of those things, there's something wrong with our bodies, is there not? This is 101. This is pretty clear. If we can't perform life to the best of our abilities, to be able to function in the way that God put us here to function, there's something off in our body. Don't forget I'm talking to you about what a healthy church should look like. Uh, many of you are familiar with the, the program Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, it's a fantastic program. It's helped many people through addictions and, and dependence on, on, on alcohol and other substances. And, and they have this... Uh, this term that I think they, they might have pioneered this group of, of self-help programs, but they're all called these 12-step programs. You've heard this, right? Do you know what Alcoholics Anonymous' first step is? I, I printed it out so I wouldn't mess it up here. Um, step one goes, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Step one. So what does that mean? More simply put, that says the first step in being successful over a problem in overcoming a difficulty in your life is admitting that you have a problem. Listen to me. I know of so many churches that are crippled by the spirit of sticking their head in the sand and not looking around at the fact that they are not healthy. And they are not accomplishing what God has put them on this earth to accomplish. The very first step in overcoming a problem is admitting that you have one. So I'm going to speak for us all. I'm going to, with one voice, enunciate something that just about every one of us in this room would acknowledge as truth. There are areas in which we are unhealthy. There are areas in which we are unhealthy. Does Jesus want us to be unhealthy? Did he shed his godhood and spill his blood for us to walk in power and victory? Does he want his church to be unhealthy in any fashion? Let not the enemy trick you into not acknowledging things that are wrong. Because he keeps you in the things that are wrong in that mindset. And Jesus says, I want you free. I want you to be more. And listen, I love this church. I just got done gushing on this church and what it's been to me and my family in this season. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus wants more for you. 
He wants more for this church. He wants more for the body of Christ in Salt Lake City, Utah. He wants more for the body of Christ in the United States of America. He wants more for the church of Jesus Christ in the world, but we're not going to get there unless we deal with some things. So I'm preaching for the next three Sundays, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to cheat here. I'm going to give you my topics for the next three Sundays because I believe that God is helping me lay out for you what a healthy church should look like and should expect. First and foremost, step number one, aside from acknowledging that we might not be healthy in all areas, is addressing whether or not we are worshipers. That's what we're going to talk about today. A healthy church can expect to be a church full of worshipers. Secondly, I'm going to talk next week about how worshiping God opens up a different kind of lifestyle. That If we're a healthy church full of healthy believers, we should look different. We should worship. We should serve with abandon. We should sacrifice joyously. We should serve our God and serve our community. If we're healthy, that's what we should expect. And the third week, I, I, I'm going to have to really try not to preach this one today and next week as we get into the, to the third Sunday. The third week, I'm going to talk about how a healthy church can expect to walk in the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. We can expect these things if we are healthy. So something you're going to hear over and over again for the next few weeks is that Jesus talks about health in the context of practicing health, that it's an ongoing decision, lifestyle, and discipline. That he can, when you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, so many things in your life become perfect, especially in the eyes of God. And then God says, oh, but there's this process that you're going to walk through. You're going you're to develop these spiritual muscles and these ways of thinking and ways of seeing. And you're going to be different. And that's going to be years of your life to get there. But what a glorious journey. What a glorious journey. How, how do I know that? I, I want to read for you. It's going to be on the screens here, too. I want to read for you... Um, Matthew 17, 14 through 21. Matthew 17, 14 through 21. Reading out of the ESV. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, you have mercy, or have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. Jesus was performing miraculous tasks. And people were bringing him the sick and the lame. Go ahead to the next screen, guys. And I brought him to your disciples. Listen to this. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples, understandably, came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast this demon out? And he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But here's the verse. But this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. What did he mean by that? In that instance, do you think that, that his disciples didn't pray over this boy when his parents brought him to, to the disciples to be healed of this demon that was afflicting him, that was causing him to have seizures and throwing him into fire and water and then threatening his very life. Do you think that in that moment the disciples didn't pray? I, I contend with you that they did. How about when the boy was brought to Jesus and Jesus says this kind never comes out except by prayer and what? Fasting. Just dissect this with me for a second. In that moment, do we honestly think that Jesus was chowing on something and and? This boy was brought to him. He goes, okay, time to fast. No, I'm going to set, set aside these fishes and loaves, right? I'm going to fast right now because that's what this moment requires. Or was he talking about a lifestyle of spiritual discipline that charges us up? 
to perform the miraculous when the miraculous is needed? Was he talking about a process of health? Listen, anybody can pray fervently when they're in a life crisis. Most do. But show me a man or a woman that prays as fervently when they're not going through crisis, and I will show you a man and a woman that has the power of God to overcome the crisis when it hits. It's a practice of health. God was basically saying in this verse, he's saying, it stores up. The power stores up in your life. If you keep a lifestyle of prayer, of fasting, of focus, of spiritual discipline, you will be ready on the day that you need to call on those things. It charges up. So I'm going to talk to us about charging ourselves up in worship. Remember, I'm talking to you about the context of what a healthy church should look like. Are we a people marked by the worship of Jesus Christ consistently? Are we a people that walk in worship? Because don't be fooled, worship is a whole lot more than just singing songs up here. I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. But worship is a lifestyle, and it can happen anywhere. But are we a people marked by the adoration of Jesus Christ? Because I'm telling you, anywhere a people is marked, are marked by worship of God, they can expect all heaven to break loose around them. So the question must be asked, are we seeing heaven break loose around us? Are are we seeing enough of the miraculous, of the presence of God, that that would tell us whether or not we are a people marked by the worship and the adoration of Jesus. Because I'm telling you, God runs to worshipers. How how do I know that? John 4.23 says it this way, and this won't be up on your screens, but just listen to me. But the hour is coming, Jesus Christ is saying this, and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Listen, 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 church. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. The hour is coming and is now here when they will worship in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking people who worship him. I looked that word up, seeking, in the Strong's, and in the original Greek, it has so much. I love dissecting words in the original language. It, it talks about a, an intense desire. This isn't God just being like, oh, I wonder where worshipers are. He's, he's yearning, longing, intensely desiring to be around a people that are worshiping him. And where they are, he is. And where he is, there is power abundant. There is peace, there is joy, there is miraculous, there is healing, there is deliverance. Are we worshipers? Are we worshipers? Being a pastor, there are many questions that I hear with repetition. And uh, none of them dismirror my own human chase after God. So when I hear them, I I think, yeah, I ask these questions too. But one of the questions I get asked most often is, how how do I know where God is? How can I be where God is? Sometimes God seems elusive to us, doesn't he? Come on, let's be honest. Sometimes God seems a little elusive to us. Sometimes because his ways are so much higher than our ways and we think so far inferior to the way that he thinks that sometimes he seems, at least to me, out of grasp. But if he's seeking worshipers, if he desires to be around worshipers, what is the answer to that question? Where is God? He's in your worship. Where is God? He's in your worship. Some of the hardest times in my life And I praise his name that I've had these opportunities that would not have been availed to me through anything else but pain and discouragement. Some of the hardest days of my life, I have learned that the only thing I have is worship. 
And when I step into it, he's there. He's there. Are we a people of worship? And we've gone through these worship wars in the church, haven't we? Because when I say worship, what's the most evangelical context that immediately pops into your mind when I say worship? Come on, talk to me. Singing, right? What we just did a few minutes ago here with Pastor Jonathan so wonderfully leading us. That's, that's our context of worship. And in that context, boy, another thing. I said a second ago that if I'm, if I'm not feeling well, I take that as a validation that I'm about to say something the enemy doesn't want me to say. I also take as the warring that we do inside the church about the context of worship as a validation of how important and powerful worship is. But we can get kind of ridiculous about it, can't we? Worship has to sound this way. I don't like that we don't do these kind of songs anymore. I don't like that we're doing these kind of songs. And what about this? And what about that? And, and what about the lights in the place? Oh. Our lighting guy just said, Preach. Thank you, Bryce. I will. Years ago, um, we had started dimming the lights around uh, the worship time. And I had a very, very good-hearted, well-intentioned man who is not here today, okay, so don't, don't worry about if you're sitting out there going, uh-oh, who's he talking about? I don't know, I've had some conversations with him about worship. No, this, no he's not here this morning. But this, this well-intentioned brother in the Lord came and, and made a meeting or uh, scheduled a meeting with me in my office over here. And uh, he, he, with a great heart, but just a misapplication, took the verse that we are children of the light and said, What's with this dimming of the lights during worship? We are children of the light, Pastor Ken. And so I sat there for a second and I said, well, let me ask you this. When you go to bed at night, do you turn the lights off or do you keep them all burning around your house? And he said, well, no, no, I I turn my lights off. And I said, okay, so, so by your logic, God isn't with you when you sleep? Because if you're a child of the light, then you have no place in darkness, right? Uh, is God less powerful when the sun sets? Does, does, that, does that make any sense? And because this thing of worship is so strongly warred against in our evangelical circles, this well-intentioned brother, who I still love with all my heart, looked at me and said, good point, but Pastor Ken, what are you going to do when I convince everybody of my age to leave the church and we're the tithers? And I was like, Wow, wow, that's, that's how strongly contested this worship thing can be. That's, so I, I said something that took a few years to reestablish a friendship with this man. I looked at him, and, and in innocence, I really wasn't trying to be blatant and abrasive. I just said, well, I guess that would give me the opportunity to rely on the fact that I know God's my provider and you aren't. He didn't like that. There was no applause going on in my office that day. But we, <laughs> we strongly contest how worship should look, and I think the enemy is just trying to get us distracted from the fact that we should just enter in no matter what. We should enter in no matter what. You see, worship is music in this context, yes, and it's powerful, I'm going to talk more about that in a second, but worship is just simply this. Okay, and this is a huge key that unlocks massive things that is very simple. So pay attention to what what I'm about to say. Worship is simply adoring Jesus. And it can and should happen anywhere. My wife and I went on vacation a few weeks ago. Actually, the week that my parents were in their motorcycle accident was the first day that we were on vacation in Florida. And uh, it's been a vacation long in coming, and we were both very much looking forward to it. And I would say it this way, we both very much needed it. And uh, the first day we're there, we get the phone call that my parents almost died. And, and so, of course, my plans were just, that, hey, the next morning we're flying back home. And I finally got a hold of my parents that night, and they both said, hey, listen, there's nothing life-threatening going on here. We will recover. Uh, you're just going to worry us and worry us more and make us feel worse if you come back. So please consider staying there and just relaxing and doing your best to, to recharge. And, and so 
We prayed about it. We felt the modicum of peace for that decision, and so we did. But honestly, I didn't really feel like that was going to happen. I, I, I felt like my heart is going to be here the entire time. I'm not really going to be able to relax and, and recharge. And to a degree, that really was true. My thoughts never left my family, and rightfully so. But God kind of gave us the ability to, to just unplug, to trust him, and to relax. And so the day after the accident, uh, we drove down to Clearwater Beach where I, I did an internship in Tampa and that was kind of the beach that I went to a lot when I was going to college. And, uh, and we just sat there watching the sun set into the water. And my thoughts turned to God. And I started saying, God, thank you. Thank you for sparing my parents' lives. Yeah, I, I don't like that this happened. I, I, I wish that it hadn't. Um, I have a question as to why you allowed it. Um, but you're God and I'm not, and I'm left with intense gratitude that I believe, like I said last week, I believe the enemy wanted to kill my parents, and you said no. You said no. So thank you. And in that moment, now there was a guy over here playing his guitar and singing, but there wasn't like worship music going on around us. In that moment, I was a worshiper watching this beautiful vista with the sun setting into the oceans that my God spoke into existence. And I got to worship right there in that moment and say, you're beautiful. I adore you. Thank you. And that was worship. That is a lifestyle that we all should have more and more and more and more. But I want to talk to you because I'm talking about healthy churches. I want to talk to you today about what we do here in the context that we know for worship. Because lifestyle can be and often is sparked by what happens in community. If we can experience healthy worship here in a way that makes us yearn for more of it, we're going to be more apt, more prone to be worshipers out there every day of our lives, music or not. Understand? So, are we worshipers? Do we enter in when we have the opportunity to? Are we healthy in this respect? Why music? Some, some may say, and I've, I've heard, heard this argument before too, some may say, you know, I feel like music can just oftentimes be an emotional manipulation. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Music is one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given mankind. And it's a communal grace. It is a common grace given to all mankind that every single one of us can enjoy, respect, and enter into music and the depth that it takes us to. But it's a gift from God, make no mistake. Why is music so adored? Why is it through the generations lauded as precious and even sacred. I've been to secular concerts where I look around, I'm like, people are worshiping here. We're made to worship. U2 was one of my favorite bands of all time. They've got a lot of spiritual themes in their music. And the last U2 concert I went to felt like church to me. Why is that? Because it's from God. It's from God. One of, one of my credos in life is, can stir the deep inside of you. Stir the, because we live a life that is constantly surface, is it not? I mean, everything around us tries to keep us on a surface level of living. Social media, our entertainment, the way we do our jobs, even interactions with one another. How are you doing today, Jerry? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm fine too. Could that really be the truth? Maybe. Oftentimes it really isn't. Why? Because we're surface. We're surface people, so I constantly say, can stir the deep. All good things that are good inside of me come from the deep of who I am, and music unlocks the deep for you. It unlocks the deep. It is a gift from Jesus Christ. And we get to use that tool to do what? Simply adore Jesus. Simply adore Jesus. That is our act of worship. We, we want so much, church. We want so much to accomplish what it is that God's put us here for. We want to live deep, don't we? Every single one of us wants to live from depth and from meaning and from relevance 
and from the sacred inside of us. We want to do, I, uh, this is one of my credos too, God, I want it to be said of Ken Kruger like it was said of King David that when he died, when he laid his head down to rest at the end of his life, that he accomplished in his generation the purpose for which God birthed him. Every single one of us want that. The inception, the beginning of meeting that goal is always worship. We approach worship from a standpoint of, of me oftentimes, don't we? We approach it like, like what, what, what do I get out of worship? And that's not at all the point. That's not at all what God wants of worship. He, he, he is primary. He is first. And then he gives to all after he is lifted high and he blindsides us with it. I can't tell you how many testimonies I know of where something huge, profound, and dynamic shifting in life, in someone's life, or in communities happens when people just, I, I've heard this over and over again, you know, all we did was get together and just start singing. All we did was get together and just start worshiping, and all of a sudden, bam, chains were falling off. People were delivered from strongholds that they'd suffered under for their entire lives. Somebody might have gotten healed and walked out whole, and all we did was get together and worship Worship blindsides us with power because he seeks it. He runs to it. And where he is, is health. Where he is, is power. I've been blindsided by it so many times in my life. I already told you that uh, last week we went over to my parents' house after, after service here and, and my sister was over there. Angie, you in the back there? How you doing? I thought that was you. And uh, we were talking about, like, I, I've got this temperamental back. And uh, oftentimes on Sunday afternoons, my back kind of hurts, so I'm hypothesizing it might be the way that I'm standing here, you know, like playing the guitar and, like, my muscles are off or something, because a lot of Sunday afternoons I'll be like, oh, it's just tight today. So I was, I was over at my parents' house when we were talking about this, and my sister, in all of her graciousness, offers to uh, loan me this, what is essentially a girdle. Uh, and she just says, and I forgot to bring it today. I would have, I would have worn it today, but I, I totally forgot about it. Uh, even though it was part of my sermon today, I should have set it aside, but I didn't. And uh, so we were laughing about how, um, how I would look. You know, of course, I would never tell you guys, say I'm wearing a girdle right now, right? And we were laughing, hey, maybe I'll look like I lost a few pounds. You know, it might be a good Sunday, but then I'm, I'm like doing this like dance for her. Like, I'm going like this. You know, and so she starts doing it. And I forget what, what song, you, like... We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house. I mean, like, really, like, anciently old, right? And so later on that day, I was like, boy, how screwed up are preacher's kids? That we've got this, like, vast back library of these ancient church songs that me and my sister are joking around about me wearing a girdle playing the guitar at church, and, like, that's the song that pops into her mind. You know, so I, I just, I, I camped on that thought and thought it was pretty amusing. And then I just got to thinking, boy, there's some really powerful songs that I was raised on. I'm sorry, I started thinking about some of them, songs that we haven't sung for years, and guess what? In just thinking about worship, I was blindsided by the presence of God. Bam, there he was. There he was. This worship thing, oh guys, it's so powerful. It's so powerful, and it's primarily him. My, my plea to you today is this. When we come together, set aside yourself. Because worship, okay, the song that I just said that my sister talked about last week, we bring the sacrifice of praise. I think oftentimes we know verses like that, and so we step into the presence of God and be like, oh, don't feel like worshiping. But God says to bring a sacrifice. And I could really use some recharging today, so, okay, Jesus. You know, if we're really bold, it's this, right? <laughs> it's not about you. Worship isn't about you. Listen, you may not know this about yourself, but you do have the God-given ability to put yourself on the back burner every once in a while. You have that ability. You probably don't think that you do, but I promise you, you do. So when you come into church, it's Jesus first. Jesus told this uh, parable I want to read for you. It's in uh, Luke. It's not going to be on the screens either, but uh, Luke 17 
starting at verse 7. He's talking, Jesus is talking to, to the crowds, and he says, well, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table. Come take care of yourself. You, you must be tired. You've had a hard day. You've had a hard week. I'm sure you're tired. You're exhausted. Come in and take care of yourself, even though you are my servant and I am your master. And Jesus goes on, will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly? And serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he even thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We embrace humility. We are always unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. What is Jesus saying here? It sounds a little self-serving, doesn't it? And if we look at it through our carnal eyes, we could look at God like C.S. Lewis used to look at God and be like, this guy is just some egotist who once says, me, 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 praise me, praise me, praise me, praise me. And then C.S. Lewis got to know God and said, oh yes, that is the only right way because God is the only entity, the only being worthy of honor and glory and praise and worship. So we don't come into this place thinking about us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we don't. The good news is we serve a God who is tremendously concerned with your life and wants to meet every single one of your needs. He's just not a God that will partake of your idolatry. Because if you are more important to you than God is to you, you are your own idol. And God will not partake or tolerate idolatry. He says, me first and then you. If we sit down and we say, God, eat of the food that you crave, then we eat very well. But it's him first and him primarily. This is the way we worship. Try me. I dare you to try me. Because we're going to end it this way. We're going to go back into a time of worship. I dare you to try me, to put, no matter how badly you might feel, and brothers and sisters, my heart breaks for you in that. I, I'm concerned if you're having a difficult season. I'm concerned if you're going through trial and tribulation and hardship, but God says, me first and then you, and oh, dear son, dear daughter, I'm going to take care of you. But he wants to teach us it's him first. We adore Jesus first. And this, uh, this, this is where we can be healthy. We can be healthy. I stand up here so many Sundays, and I'll start leading in worship. And, it, and I'll say it this way. It's kind of a simplistic way of saying it. But there are Sundays we got it and Sundays we don't. Um, I'm human. I, I've got my ups and downs. I, I'm far from perfect, but I will tell you this much, and I'll tell you this much with confidence in the house of God. What I bring to this stage every Sunday is pretty consistent. What I've said to God for many, many years now is I'm going to go there whether or not they go with me. So I'm up here to worship, but I can't bring power into this room the way that you can. I can't. Pastor Jonathan can't. Lisa can't. Gavin can't. Our backup vocalists can't. It's you. And when I'm standing up here worshiping God and I look out and I see somebody who's got it, oh, the power that I see on them. You are more powerful than you know. You are tremendously powerful and you can invite power into this room the way that I can't. It's not my job. It's yours. It is not my job. It's yours. But because you can because this thing of worship is available to all who will. We can be a healthy church that experiences the presence of God every time we get together, we can. It's our birthright. It's who we are. It's what we're supposed to be. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, okay, but what about this, and what about this in my life? And I need to, and yes, yeah, God wants to intervene in your life, and he wants to take you over, and he wants to meet your needs. He wants to miraculously and supernaturally interact, interact with you in your circumstance. But I am here to tell you, as sure as I'm looking at you right now and speaking to you with my voice right now, worship is the first step. Amen. Worship is the first step. It will open everything for you. Because you cannot, Live a powerful and overcoming lifestyle unless you are in the very presence of God. 
I need to be in the presence of God. You need to be in the presence of God. So worship team, come back up here. God is seeking those who will worship him. He is seeking people who adore Jesus and lift him high before they are concerned about themselves. Because I believe Jesus says this, if you lift me high, I'll be concerned about you. I'll take care of you. I'll supernaturally intervene in your life. But it's me first. Adore me first. And then see the power. See the wonder of Jesus Christ. So let's do it. Stand with me, and we're going to end in worship. Let's glorify the Lord. Let's praise Jesus' name together. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, our King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Our sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, our King. What a wonderful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, how we worship your name, the name that is above every name. Because it is at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue will complain that he is Lord. Because death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. And you have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. And yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ our King, what a powerful name it is. 
and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ our King what a powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus oh Lord there is power there is hope there is life in the name of jesus christ we lift up your name we adore your name because you alone are worthy oh death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again and you have no rival you have no equal and now and forever god you reign and yours is the kingdom and yours is the glory yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus one more time what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of jesus christ our king what a powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus Let the music fade. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Some of you older saints sing with me. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven 
and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name give the lord a clap of praise today Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your grace to us. And Lord, as we go from this place, <laughs> take this adoration, Lord. Take this love. Let it dwell richly in our hearts and minds. And let it be said of us that we did not come to church we left here being the church to a world who needs Jesus Christ, a world who needs to feel what we're feeling now, a world who needs the freedom that we're experiencing now, a world that needs the presence of God so desperately in the midst of trouble and turmoil and political strife and wars and rumors of wars. The solution for all of that is the name of Jesus Christ. So Lord, let your church be the church as we leave today, as we go, as we fellowship with one another, and as we show and live the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world around us. We ask this in Jesus' name today. Amen.